Uh, Jean-Baptiste, s'il vous plaît. Excellent, thank you. On order, five covers table two, five pigeon salad, five brill. Oui. Yes, oui. Bon. Today's starter is a very rustic pigeon salad with a hazelnut vinaigrette, and it has to be the most perfect time of the year for a pigeon salad. This is a fantastic mix of flavours with a gamey taste of pigeon, set off by the rich nuttiness of hazelnuts, the earthiness of the beetroot combined with the oak leaf lettuce. Wakey, wakey now. Now it's, uh, yes? Understand what you're doing. Don't panic, don't rush, yes? But get a grip. Now, you've probably never cooked with pigeon before, but it really is easy, very straightforward, so go on, have a go. Now, we're not cooking town pigeons from Trafalgar Square. These are actually wood pigeons that have led a much happier life and obviously eaten from all over the woodlands, making them a lot tastier bird. Now, the secret behind cooking the pigeon perfectly is you've only got to cook it between four and five minutes. Start off on the skin, colour it and turn it over, and then put your butter in. Helping us cook tonight are two commies. This week is Danny, he's a 21-year-old from Essex. He's passionate about cooking and he's been working in kitchens for six years. He's a chef at a pub brasserie in Essex. I just really want to better my career. I want to be successful in what I do. I don't, I don't want to work in a pub for the rest of my life. I want to work in London's top restaurant. And Phil, he's 19 and he's from the Wirral and has just won Wirral Chef of the Year 2005. Is that a good thing? I'll find out tonight. I want to be right up there at the top with the, well, with the likes of Gordon Ramsay to work in Claridge's. Be massive. I want Phil in there doing that now. I want Phil in there doing that now. I want Phil in there doing that now. That's three times. I'm not saying it again. Yeah? There you go. Control it. I want the oil nice and brown, not black, Phil. And don't be scared to take it off the heat when it's getting too hot, yes? Pigeon is a very lean meat, you know that. Very, very little fat in the centre, so be very careful because if it's too hot, you're going to overcook it. Yeah? It dries out instantly. Be very careful. Phil and Danny are competing head to head. And at the end of the night, I'll decide who's staying and who's going home. Now, to finish the top of the salad, we've got cloves of garlic that have been sliced very, very thin. But that's too strong for this salad, so we're going to fry it very, very quickly. Once they're cooked, drain them from the oil, and you've got these really nice, fine garlic chips. OK, start the plate up, yes? That's your bowl. Danny, that's your bowl. Start off with a nice little handful of nuts. Quick. Gently, gently. OK, beetroot on top. Some picked coriander leaves in there. Coriander. Some beans in there. Mm. Now, don't get your hands in there yet. Don't you dare get your hands in there yet. This is a salad that dresses itself. Rock salt. Just a touch in there, touch. yes? OK, now watch. You get the bowl and you just roll it round. I don't want hands in there. Combine the salad, the beans, nuts, coriander. On. Let's go. Make sure it's evenly distributed. Yes? Good. Watch. You get the breast like that, and you just slice down, mm. almost like you're slicing smoked salmon. Then you get your vinaigrette, mm. and you just glaze over whilst it's still nice and warm. Yeah? OK. Now, garlic chips. You take a little handful, and you just scatter them around nicely. You don't throw them on there, you just scatter them around. The smell coming from that plate is phenomenal. You happy yes. with that? Yeah? Good. Send it. Five salad of pigeon. Table six, please. Beetroot, lots more hazelnut. Yeah, don't skim. Okay, then, how was the pigeon? Uh, lovely. A beautiful, fat, really happy uh -huh. bird. Nice wood pigeon, you know, not, yeah. not a nasty Trafalgar Square thing. Really happy with it. Salad, a little bit imbalanced, I thought, a little bit. Really? Yeah, the beetroot I wouldn't walk a mile for, but really? that was great. And what about the uh, what about the turkeys? What about the Christmas dinner? Yeah. How that, is that coming along? It started off as a really good idea, but it looked lovely on what yeah. I saw. But I didn't actually realise how much hard work was involved in sort of you know, coming to terms with growing your own Christmas dinner. The turkeys are at war, and poor old Gary is coming off worse. Oh, do you know who pecks on him? Go on. Nigella. Nigella. Oh, she pecks on everybody. She pecks on my bum. I want to be sure the turkeys are really fattening up. Peter the vet has suggested that we weigh them each week. Hello, Gordon. What did you say, Peter? What I brought along with me today is a spring balance. Spring balance. And a bag that we can put him in. Almost like and a fishnet. That's right, yeah. <laughs> OK. And this is a good way to remind the kids that the turkeys are livestock for the Christmas table and not pets. Two handles on the side. There we go. There we go. Anthony? No, he's on he's five. <laughs> Let's get Delia. 11 kilos. Ainsley is running at uh, six kilos. Well, she's... Oh, dear. Nigella doesn't seem keen to reveal her weight. 
Such a bitch. Come on. What's that? Woo! Twelve and a half kilo. Right. Twelve and a half kilo. She is definitely the biggest bird, mate. So Delia and Nigella are big birds. Jamie, Gary and Ainsley need to put on some muscle. And little Anthony is the runt of the bunch. Next morning, we're out early to feed up those turkeys. Are they in? No. Oh, come on. Oh, no. Oh, come on, darling. Let's go say good morning to the turkeys, yes? Yeah, let's go. Up, up. Quick. It seems that the perch couldn't take Nigella's weight. Oh, no. Nigella? I can't believe she's broken the stand. Look at Nigella. Naughty, Nigella. Naughty, naughty. Naughty, Nigella. Nigella scrapes Anthony's beak. Nigella's the troublemaker. Nigella is the big troublemaker. She's a very naughty Why? troublemaker. I'm worried about Nigella's aggressive behaviour, so I've brought in some expert help. We're all getting very concerned about Nigella. She's over 12 and a half kilo. Is it normal for a bird to be so big? The, the fleshy parts develop much more. The crunkles down yep. here, these are all the bobbly bits. This is the wattle. And he's just got a little beard here. See, that's just growing. Uh, it's like horse hair. I can't believe Nigella's got a beard. I think she's a man. Really? Yeah. She's not a Nigella, she's a Nigel. And Nigella's not the only she, that's a he. The other turkey's caruncles and wattles are a dead giveaway, apparently. So Nigella's a man, Ainsley and Anthony are girls. Mm -hmm. That means Delia, the or big Delia. one next to... I mean, yeah. that clearly looks like a man. I think it should be Dennis, actually. It looks like Gary is a man. Gary is a man. Yeah, which is good news. I think it's good news for Gary. Now, Jamie at the back is an interesting one. You sometimes get turkeys that look as though they could be either or. Either it sometimes or. does happen. God. I'm sure whatever their sex, they'll taste delicious. Now, good evening. How are you? Um, very well indeed, thank you. How are you? Yeah, that was the pigeon was fantastic. I'm really, glad you enjoyed really it. Lovely. I'd never had pigeon before, and it was really tender and really, really nice, and the whole... The whole, all the flavours mixed together, the beetroot and the garlic and everything, it was, it was lovely. I imagined that it would taste like chicken, but in fact, it's a very meaty taste. It's, it's very nice, a bit like beef, in fact. I didn't actually realise you're such a foodie. I love it. I really oh. love, love food, absolutely. Now, um, you're a bit of a ladies' man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah as, a, as a romance, no, but I mean, <laughs> okay. would you prefer taking them out for dinner or would you prefer cooking a romantic meal? Oh, I think cooking a romantic meal is the, the best thing. I cooked some wild salmon recently. Wild salmon, and nice. it's just very simple, yep. just um, with some olive oil, lemon. Probably let, let it down by doing mashed potato, <laughs> which is real, real boys' food, isn't it? Mashed potato with wild salmon. <laughs> Uh, who was that for? Um, a friend. Oh, no, Leg, come on. <laughs> Nobody Whisper in my ear. What was her name? <laughs> Damn, did she stay for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Next on the menu, along with our main course of brilliant red wine. It looks disgusting, though. What, what's all this stuff? We discover what's really in the humble supermarket sausage. Skin, brained, gristle, tendon, sinew. And Rod Stewart's fiance drops in just weeks away from giving birth. Ready, Phil? Ready, go. Starter's on. gone. Yes. Starter's Every table gone. happy. Yeah. Four brill and four brill. Let's go. Yes. Hey. Welcome back to the F word. Remember, everything I cook here, you can quite easily cook at home. Have a go. Wakey, wakey, please. Now, time for the main course, which is brill poached in red wine served with crushed celeriac, finished with a touch of cream and roasted salsify. Tables going now, Mark. People don't actually think about cooking a white fish in a red wine, but it actually tastes amazing and it looks fantastic when you cut into it. Brill. Razor sharp knife. Fillet. Nice, long slices. That's the first one off. Up. Brill bones and turbot bones are the most sought after in any kitchen. That will make the most perfect fish top. Skin. And just pull. This little bit here is called the skirt. That's lovely inside a fish pie. It really is delicious. Season. Both sides. Red wine. 
thyme, bay leaf, garlic, salt, pepper, and olive oil. Poach. The sauce. Shallots. Um, it's a bit of a sort of cook's thing, really, because onions are far too strong. A shallot is quite mellow. Butter. It gets some real nice colour on there. I want this nice, real nut brown flavour on the shallot. Sugar. Really starts to caramelise those shallots. Beautiful shine on there. Raspberry vinegar. In. And it just sort of wakes everything up a little bit. Add poaching wine. Reduce. 50 grams of butter. Shake it into the sauce. Fish slice onto the plate. Brill in red wine sauce. Done. Now, when you're filleting a fish, use a very flexible, sharp knife because let the knife do the work. And a brew like this actually comes with its own instructions because all you have to do is follow the lines. So we start from the head, we come in, cut round the head, and then just one clean sweep down that line and just go all the way down to the tail. And look what happens. The knife actually cuts away the fillet and then lay the fillet back on top of the brill and just follow the knife all the way through. That's the first fillet off, literally two sweeps. Every drawer should have these four very simple, straightforward knives. The filleting knife that does the work for you, that's a flexible blade that bends round the bone on the fish and doesn't allow it... Oh, <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I owe, I, shit, I've just stabbed Danny. Um, have you got a plaster? Neil, I owe you a knife, OK? <laughs> to go with the brill, we're serving two vegetables you may not have cooked with before. Crushed celeriac, brought together with some cream, and then some roasted salsify. Salsify tastes like a cross between artichoke and turnip. Don't overcook it, as it adds great texture to the dish. I add it to onions sautéed in oil. A knob of butter browns them nicely and finishes off the flavour. Yeah. Now, celeriac is a very versatile vegetable. Great as a puree, even great in soups, and you can actually eat it raw. OK, plate's ready? Plate's ready. In the restaurant tonight is Rachel Cook, a journalist who's passionate about good food. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> How was your pigeon? Uh, it was delicious. Yes. Thank you. It was a wood pigeon, yeah, yes. not a pigeon from yes. Trafalgar Square. Yeah. And so you must um, care about meat, I mean, where your meat comes yeah. from. I've always cared, sort of, and not just for my own personal you know, benefit, but obviously yeah. for the customer benefit, yeah. the fact that we give them that level of security to make sure that transparency yeah. is there for them to understand. Yeah. So you've been looking into supermarket meats for us? I have. I've been looking at sausages. I've been trying to look beyond the packaging to see what actually goes into the sausage. In the UK, we spend over half a billion pounds on sausages every year. But do you really know how much meat goes into your average economy banger? And do you know what else goes in there besides? Does Wait, it taste it's... meaty? It does taste meaty. Does it? Yeah, it looks a bit bendy. <laughs> I'd say it's about... Um, 70%. 70% meat. That is actually an economy sausage from a supermarket, yeah. and it contains 32% meat. I'm appalled that a sausage can have as little as 32% meat. The rest of it is mainly water and breadcrumbs, by the way. But more shocking still is what that 32% can be made up of. When it says meat on a label for a product such as a sausage, it doesn't actually just mean lean meat. It means other things like fat, connective tissue. And connective tissue is things like skin, rind, gristle, tendon, sinew. So over half the so-called meat content can be gristle and fat, and it's still allowed to be called meat on the label. It is safe and it is legal, but if I'm going to eat gristle and sinew, I want to know about it. And I think the current labelling system is misleading. Earlier this year, 
Gordon and his team of food technologists investigated the contents of economy sausages from the big four supermarkets to see how much so-called connective tissue they contained in total. The results are enlightening, if not surprising. Our research showed that the connective tissue levels varied amongst the supermarkets. Uh, Morrison's had 7.5%. ASDA 10%, Sainsbury's 22% and Tesco 24% connective tissue. So according to tests carried out by Gordon earlier this year, the economy sausage being sold by Britain's biggest supermarket contains the most connective tissue. That skin, rind, gristle, tendon and sinew to you and me. So how can you spot better quality sausages in the supermarket? Well, there's one very simple trick to remember when buying. If a packet of sausages is labelled simply sausages, like these. The legal requirement is that they contain just 32% meat. If, on the other hand, the label says pork sausages, like these, the legal requirement is that they contain 42% meat. To demonstrate what all this means in practical terms, I went to visit Top Butcher's Moan and Sons, winner of 12 awards at this year's National Sausage Competition. Show me what you put in one of your sausages. Okay, this is the meat here. This is for an 80% meat content sausage. And how many um, sausages would you be able to make out of that meat? Uh, approximately 120. So, Richard, you're going to help me make a sausage that's just on the limit of the regulations. Now, I'm going to make 120 sausages. This is the meat of my sausages, but it doesn't look like meat at all. How much is that? What percentage? Um, this is a 32% meat content sausage. It looks disgusting, though. What, what's all this stuff? Um, well, this is connective tissue. You're allowed a quarter in, in your recipe. Right. And um, this is pork fat, and you're allowed 30%. We've also got this. Is that going in the sausage too? Yeah, that's the extra bits. You know, so long as you declare it on your label, then that's fine. Yeah. So, going into the barely legal banger is 32% meat, which includes fat and gristle. Then extra fat and gristle, three kilos of rust, and some colouring and herbs. So here it is, the barely legal banger. Technically, it's a sausage. And under current labelling guidelines, it can be sold as a sausage. Um, I, th I think the law should be looked into just to clarify what is actually called meat. Um, in my mind, meat is really lean meat and fat. Um, I wouldn't really call gristles and, and skin or connective tissues um, meat. So how did our testers react when they found out exactly what we put in our barely legal banger? It's repulsive. I mean, you, you can basically just get away with anything by just by putting mm. meat down. You would assume yes. that if it says meat, you would hope it's the finest cuts of the mm. best raised beef or pork. No, now I think I will go for it. Really? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Drastic. So when you're shopping for meat, always read the label, check the water content. Check the percentage of meat included, but remember that with sausages, 55% of the meat can be made up of fat and gristle, and that's in addition to the fat and gristle that you'll find on the label. Secondly, if you're buying sausages, always look out for the ones that are labelled pork sausages rather than the ones that are just vaguely labelled sausages. They're more likely to have more meat in them. So if you're not keen on connective tissue, you might want to think about which supermarket you buy your sausages from. That looked extremely grim. Yeah, quite grim. What are, what are your sort of main conclusions well, then after that? I think there are two things. First thing is that the label may not tell you all there is to know, mm -hmm. so read it carefully. And if you want less connective tissue in your economy sausage, then, well, I wouldn't go to Tesco or Sainsbury's. Now we'll put a little bit of salsify on top of these last ones, yes? So lift up the brill, drain it. No, no, nice and gently. Lift it up, OK? And the curvy side sits up. OK? So it doesn't look upside down. Oh, yeah. That's it. Good. Lift it up, drain off the red wine and sauce. Generous on the sauce, OK? Because all the sauce is is the cooking liquor from the brill. OK? So that's why... OK, table mark, please. Good. Very nice. Table eight. Gently. Excuse me. Go. Table eight. Good. The main course was, was lovely. I really liked all the different flavours that were going on. Well, I, thought, I actually thought the fish was really succulent and the sauce, um, it really complemented it well. It was quite spicy and quite tangy. 
It's really good. Um, not so sure it was underneath it. It was fine. Um, I don't know what it was, but yeah, I think it really all went together quite well. Okay. How was that? It was, it was fantastic. I love it. It's all, all kind of dark purple, then you cut yeah. in and it's white. Bright, brilliant white. And you have that smell of, of red wine and onion, so you think you're eating steak, and then it, it, it tastes like fish, and it reminds you how meaty the brill is. Mm. So it's, and it, and it's, it's slimming, yeah. Now, for some bizarre reason, last week we actually started talking about your sperm count and my sperm count. It's amazing. We must have run out of other things to talk about. I, it was because, it was because we, I discovered that sperm counts had dropped off over the last 50 years, you know, among males all over the world, uh, and, and, it, and partly because of diet. Mm -hmm. And I thought I might find out what my sperm count was uh, and see if I could do anything to improve it with, uh, with what I eat. I found out eight years ago that I have a low sperm count, and last week, Giles went to have his checked out too. Well, I, I don't really know what I was worrying about there. It's uh, the old magic is still there. His count was fine, but the sperm was slightly misshapen. Yours is 14, which is borderline. In the last 50 years, toxins in the food chain have helped cause the average man's sperm count to plummet more than 50%. Misshapen or immobile sperm is increasingly common. Diet can play a major part in increasing men's fertility. And top sperm foods include nuts, red peppers, cabbage, fish and dairy. Um, Zita, yeah. is there a crisis with men's sperm? There is. Um, male fertility is definitely on um, the decline, and I think that men are really neglected in this whole area. And do you really believe that a diet can actually help increase the sort of the sperm you know, development, production? Yeah, absolutely. What kind of things should they eat? Well, the food we've got here, nuts um, and seeds are very, very important. Uh -huh. Rich in selenium, rich in zinc. Um, oily fish, very important. Rich in um, omega-3, DHA, sure. very important for the head and the tails of the sperm. And then um, fruit and vegetables, mm -hmm. rich in antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, yeah. to protect the sperm against damage from free radicals. Uh, is there something I can specifically eat to, to improve the shape of my sperm? Yeah, I think that, the, you know, the food here would be very, very good, um, alongside uh, drinking plenty of water um, and lifestyle mm -hmm. factors, and in your case, Giles, you know, a lot of alcohol. If I haven't, haven't drunk lots of alcohol, how am I going to end up in a position to meet people yeah. and then probably... You're, not, you're clearly not listening to what Zita said. Stop <laughs> <No>. drinking. <laughs> Gordon, yes. first of all, can I just say, um, I'm really pleased you're here. What exactly is the problem? Yeah, well, I was told, just coming up for two years ago, uh -huh. that I had poor spare mortality. I produce yeah. sperm, but they don't go anywhere. And in that situation, there'd be no chance yeah. of a, uh, uh, just uh, having yeah. a baby naturally. But is there any form of diet, Zeta, that can actually turn Gordon's problem around and get them moving and working? Well, we, we, I was talking to Gordon over dinner about his yeah. diet, and, you know, we've discovered that he wasn't eating breakfast, um, but also drinking a lot of fizzy drinks, um, right. which contain lots of preservatives and chemicals, yeah. which, you know, aren't good. Eating loads of crisps, yeah, yeah. And, and drinking plenty of water. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of men don't drink enough water, and sperm yeah. need to swim at the end of the day. Yeah, You're not drinking the water, yeah. you can and get energetic. dehydrated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Cheryl, I've got a theory about this particular sort of um, low sperm count, because I actually believe, especially in the chef world, a lot has to do with the heat, and being enclosed in those confined conditions under that amount of pressure. And when you look at the position of a stove in a kitchen, it really is on line with your scrotum. I've got my chefs to go and do a test, and the sort of results have been quite fascinating. Um, yes. Sarge, two seconds. Um, so the sperm count, how were they? Um, good sperm count, but just yep. you know, not, not particularly, um, you know, well in motion and um, um, deformed heads, so like sm small, narrow heads. Really? Yeah. And Cheryl, is that to do with the heat or is that a, you know, a common? Well, these studies have shown that, that it can affect sperm, what we call sperm morphology, the shape of the sperm. Right. It can affect the shape, it can affect the motility, and it can affect the count as well. Um, but um, obviously we, we'd have to do a study, on, yep. a, a proper controlled study on chefs. Mm -hmm. And, and actually measure scrotal temperatures yeah. and these sorts of things yeah. to see whether, in fact, sure. you are going to see, yeah. see an so effect. So there could be a possibility. I mean, on the Absolutely. back of the you know, yeah. history Absolutely. with the firemen, the bakers, yeah. I mean, you Absolutely. know, chefs may suffer from that problem down the line. And personally, Absolutely. now, I'm yes. going to do a ring around and maybe come back to this topic. Next on the menu, the pressure's on for my commies as they go head-to-head -head over pudding. Will it be Danny's pear crepes or Phil's chocolate fondant? How dare you come to the F word <laughs> with all those French <laughs> fighting right now and you want to bring in a chocolate fondant? And Giles Corrin sinks the new depths. Squirrel for his supper. That's the little front legs, all its little livers and kidneys, the heart and soul of the squirrel, mashed up, high tasting, quite smelly, in a little pie case.
Now it's dessert time, and this week we're going to turn up the heat on our commies with Danny and Phil cooking the dessert of their choice. Phil. How are we, Gordon? So what are we doing? Uh, we're doing a chocolate fondant, mate. Yep. Um, between now and midnight, I want you to forget the word mate and just remember the word Gordon, because I'm not your mate. Where did the idea come from? Uh, Raymond Blanc. Who? Raymond Blanc. I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sure you can, go. Has anyone heard of Raymond Blanc before? So, it's based yeah. on that, but I use it's it. based on Raymond Blanc. I, I How use... dare you come to the F word <laughs> with all those French <laughs> fighting right now, and you want to bring in a chocolate fondant? Ah, huh? dear, oh dear. So you've got the egg yolks, lightly whisked, and what's in the egg white? You take to like a stiff peak, or yeah, also a soft peak. Can you sit it on top of your head? I can't. Yeah, we're all right with yeah, that one. That's a brave move. All right, that's all right, that's all right, all right. Well that one. done. And if they don't come out and they stick to the mould, you can blame the French. Is that right? That's right, Gordon. Fantastic. That's right. That's a brave move there. You know that. <laughs> So, Phil's choice is the chocolate fondant, which is a very, very brave choice because they're so difficult to get right. And you never know when they're perfect and just until you're about to serve them. So when we cook them in the restaurant, we always cook two, just in case one's about to collapse or somewhat dry in the middle. Can never happen in a restaurant. Now, Danny's playing it really safe. He's just making a very straightforward, plain Jane pancake. But I have to say, I admire his balls to keep it so simple. What's inside the pancake? Inside the pancake is going to be vanilla poached pear. Uh -huh. On top of the pancake is going to be just like a dark chocolate sauce. So what are you put in there? What have I put in there? Yeah. Sugar, one cup, two vanilla pods, fresh. Yeah. Can I um, can I suggest you turn it down a little bit? Turn when it the down. poached pear yeah. is poached, not rapidly boiling. Yeah. Still can't believe you come in here with a French man's recipe. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Let's hope that works. Especially people. for you, Gordon. Uh, especially for me. Especially you know I love you. the French. Hello, good to see you. Well, yes. you're looking absolutely fantastic. Thank you, darling, thank you. You've been getting bigger. I know. While you go through all the motions, <laughs> has he been cooking for you? Surely Rod can cook. I mean, he's he a man can, of the world. He can. He um, he does do a good egg. And do you have a sweet tooth? I mean, do you like sort of chocolate fondant? That is my, that is my biggest downfall, is, is chocolate. Does he ever take pudding to bed? Not, not pudding to bed, no. I think he doesn't like, you know, crumbs and things. It's has to be messy. <laughs> but, um, just the last few weeks, I've been um, having warm milk. He said a couple of weeks ago to me personally, he's <laughs> actually going to be in the birthing pool. We won't be bathing. With... Hopefully, he'll bathe before he gets in the birthing pool. Flipping heck. What's that going to be like? It's like a large jacuzzi. Nice. And it's quite hot, yeah. Um, and I believe that the water will be sort of up to about here. Mm -hmm. You're both going to be naked, right? He's going to be. Well, no, I think, I think he's going to wear a pair of trunks. Be... Speedos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, now, it's been a bit of a manic week um, this end because. Um, there's been a debate about sperm. Um, how's Rod's sperm? Well, as you can see, he's still got plenty of bullets in his rifle as he puts it. All those years of tight trousers and bloody leather trousers with no pants, so well, how we, does it we become so mecca? When we visited the doctor last September, when we were planning to have children, he did say because of our, both of our ages that yeah. it could take some time. And we were like, OK, well, is there any particular yeah. things we can do to Hang help? loose, yes. loose pants. So it was, he was very good. He had showers only, no bath, Seriously. no bubble bath. Um, and, and the loose pants. We had to go out and search for these, you know, the boxes and things. You know? Really? No, we did, we did actually freeze his sperm in case there were going to be a... problems. Oh, OK. Yeah? Later on, yeah, of course. Uh, we were at home. We didn't do it in, in no, our no, hospital. Ice cream, no, no, at, at home. And then I rushed down in the Ferrari with my handbag with the little vial next to it. You know, like, I felt like I was... <laughs> Frozen sperm. Have you any idea how expensive that ice cube could be? I know. <laughs> Good to see you, mate. Lovely. Thank Likewise. you. Likewise. Mm. Take care, Good guys. to see you. Thank you. It's the moment of truth for the two commies and their puddings. They're both very different desserts and they're going to be judged by, yeah, the Women's Institute of Fulham. Jean-Baptiste, okay. uh, go with the pancake, please. I'll take the chocolate fondant. Let's go. OK, ladies, that is uh, chocolate fondant. Chocolate fondant. Oh, that looks good. Very soft and just sort of yeah, falls away, nice which is good that it's not dry and crumbly. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that gives them a, mm. a thumbs up. I like the fact it's not that sweet. It's very, very nice. Mm. It's actually yeah. not very heavy. It's, it's nice you can and eat light. I'm fascinated on the whole sort of Women's Institute becoming a younger, vibrant, sexier sort of group. What the f*** is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I think there's a resurgence. Just like knitting's becoming cool, the WI's coming cool because we're much more younger and I think we're coming back to what, you know, being practical is, is sexy again. 
but you don't look like a lady from the WI, for goodness <laughs> sake. Well, that's good that we're flying the flag, but it's yeah, all changing. Yeah. Change. 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 Yeah. Second dessert, um, a very simple um, poached pear um, in a warm pancake. This presentation looks yeah. really yeah. good. Mm. The pears, they're not crunchy mm. at all. So mm. that's, <laughs> and that's nice. Yet yeah, they're not sloppy. Mm. So they're just the right texture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the chocolate's nice really with it as well. well. Keep going, oh, this is, mm, this is really nice. And the pancake is too much. really lovely. So we'd like a vote. Um, chocolate fondant or crepe? I think the crepe, which surprises me because normally I'm a chocolate freak and I would absolutely love it, but actually the pears were superb and I really enjoyed the crepe. Crepe. It would be crepe. crepe. Definitely the crepe. Definitely the crepe. Definitely the crepe. The crepe, and I don't even like pears. It's going to be five out of five. Crepe. Mm, Zero, dear. Definitely, it's the crepe. Nigella or Delia? Nigella. Nigella. Oh, <laughs> yes. Meat or fish? Meat. Meat. I'll get fish. Fish. And finally, just before I go, <laughs> me or Jamie? Oh, God. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Ladies, thank you. Cheers. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Whew. Well. That was a lovely bunch of uh, WI members um, from Fulham. Amazing ladies. Um, very constructive, very critical. Um, the winning dessert, yeah, the dessert that the diners are going to be eating tonight is the pancake. Yeah. Well done. Now, Thank you. You haven't won the overall thing. However, you're definitely going to be serving your dessert tonight. And knowing you, yeah, you're going to take it on the chin like a man and really help this man with the dessert. Oh, definitely. Without Without Right, uh, ladies, I need some help in the kitchen, yeah? You're yeah, experts, right? right? Uh, yeah. yeah? OK, <laughs> let's go. Up, you know. No, not washing up. A little bit more exciting than that. You know that. Yeah? I, I want some real WI pancakes. Go, table eight. Go. You've got two more to come. I need two more pancakes, followed by four more, ladies, yes? Yeah, Did you excellent. toss perfectly? Perfectly, Do it yeah. again for me. Show me. <laughs> So, yeah, you can. Fantastic. <laughs> now I need five more portions, ladies. Sorry, Table eight. So how does that feel, having the whole dining room eating your dessert? Yeah, it feels good. You won't compliment at all. No. It's quite amazing what's just happened. And You've just served 60 customers yeah. with your dessert. And it shows how the simple tactic pulled yes. off. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So for God's sake. I hear that people are still talking about your Get Women Back in the Kitchen campaign. It seems to have hit a real nerve. And do you know what? Some are really happy and some people are really unhappy. But the most important thing, they're actually talking about it. I'd rather have a career than cook, to be honest. I think it's nice for a woman to be able to cook a really nice meal for a man to come home to at the end of the day. I think Gordon should sod off for saying that. It's shared responsibility, busy lifestyles, everybody's responsibility to do the cooking in a household. Women or men, it doesn't matter who it is, really. People should be cooking. I think cooking is very good. It's very therapeutic. How many women know how to gut a chicken? My grandma could do it and I'd sit and watch her. Well, why should you have to cook when you could buy it already cooked for you? How many women know how to make the money go further by making homemade cakes, rissoles, whatever? That is a lost art. Oh, well, I think he's absolutely right. I mean, my wife, I mean, she wouldn't know what to do with a meal. I mean, everything's just frozen from the freezer into the, into the microwave. I'm still receiving lots of requests of women all over the country, and uh, this time I went to Cheshire to help two Bridget Joneses. I'm Georgina, and this is my friend Naomi, who's also my flatmate. I feel the fact that I can't cook is really a social embarrassment now. We've got a lovely clean cooker and oven. Lovely and clean because it doesn't get used. Well, there isn't much cooking done in our kitchen, but we do. We are very well stocked with cocktail glasses, cocktail shakers. A blender for daiquiris. Cocktail cupboard. I want Gordon Ramsay to teach me how to make a meal to impress a man. We're going to get two men round, we're going to cook them some food, and we're going to make sure that they are impressed with our food. Why can't you cook? The reason I'm so bad at cooking is because I had such a bad experience at school. I had a cookery teacher who was mean and she picked on me. Every time I made something, it was wrong. And she's put me off for life. You're both single? Yes. Yeah. What would you look for in a man? I like a nice, tall, blonde, hunky Viking type. Right, OK, yes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> rough and ready and wrinkled. This is the cocktail cupboard. Bloody hell. How many cocktail shakers have you got? Three. What is that? I'll give you an it's example. like something you stick on the end of your boobs. You stick that on the end of a glass. <laughs> the place is more set out like a cocktail bar uh -huh. as opposed to a kitchen. So, um, all jokes apart, very serious, yeah? Yes. Um, it's not good for me to do this because you're going to be cooking it, okay? okay? But if I was coming around here tonight for a date, yep. um, I'd expect a good old-fashioned steak and chips. Yep. I want you to make the sauce for the steak. Okay. Butter, egg yolks and tarragon. You with the chips, right. pan of water on, bring okay. up to the boil, potatoes, okay. part cooked, taken out of the water, cut into quarters, on a tray, rosemary, a little garlic, olive oil, and they go in the oven as the guys arrive. Okay, shall we get cracking? I know how to do it. I know you're supposed to do that. The key to a perfect bolognese sauce is to beat it well. And you just trickle the butter in there like that. Mm. And again, don't stop. <laughs> Tarragon in. Get your fingers in there. Good. There you go. Good. <laughs> What's the most important thing about cooking a steak? Guessing what on it? Colour. Right, salt, pepper. OK. And you always season the steak two minutes before it goes in the pan. In. No, I told you not to throw it in there. Oh. You're splashing it. Right. Now, we're getting colour on it. Right. When, right. We, when we come to turn it, over mm. and in. Half of that butter in, please. Half. Half, that's it. Now, the butter doesn't burn now. If we put the butter in first, it will burn so the steak gets black. Touch it. Good, touch. Right, concentrate. Really concentrate. That's rare. There's no bounce back. There's no bounce. Look, back into the pan. I'm going to take it to medium. Just put your fingers on top there and touch that. And notice there's some spring. Yeah. It's coming back at you now. It's bouncing back up. Yeah, it's yeah. no longer rare in the centre. All right, so that is medium. That's a yeah. beautiful medium. Now we're going to take it to medium well. Well done. And this is how my young cooks start learning how to cook steak perfectly. They close their eyes and they guess how that steak's cooked. Mm. Close your eyes. By touching. Drain off the potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Have we got some olive oil? Yes. Yeah. Cut the potatoes in half. In half again. And then we'll do each quarter in half again. So we've got the meal sorted out. Now we just need some men to eat it. Cooking uh, with two ladies tonight, actually teach them how to cook. Yep. OK, problem is, they've got no fellas. Fancy dinner tonight with two beautiful girls. I've got a girlfriend. You've got a girlfriend. Uh, Damn. What about you? Same, same. Girlfriend, I'm afraid. My girlfriend would cut my balls off like so. Sorry, mate. OK. Because <laughs> it's Liverpool, Chelsea. Are there any single men in Wimslow? Wow, wow, wow. Christ almighty. That's not bad. Oh, we huh? scrub up well. You scrub up very well. Five minutes. Right, you ready? Happy okay, Chris. <laughs> what flowers? Indeed, yeah. Well, they come through. Let's go and get down. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Right, no, I think that's what colour like, is it? Good, lovely colour. Yeah. That looks nice. Let's stick the salad on the side. Mmm, that looks nice. Steak and chips. Rocket parmesan salad, fresh lemon juice in there, nice. Bernay sauce on the side. Go for it. Voila. Bon appetit. That is absolutely spot on, bro, that. We'll see if it makes the, uh, the taste great. Hang on. Ten out of ten. <laughs> OK. So far, so good? It's great. Well done. And just a personal message. Less cocktails, more cooking. Good night, guys. Have a nice evening. Yeah. And okay. um, I'll let myself out. OK. Yes. Right, good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, I need to stay Right, uh, Naomi and Georgina, Hello. good to see you. Please tell me, you've done some cooking since I've gone. We have. We've done we a duplicate meal, actually, haven't we? Yeah. How, how were the chips done? Oh, they were better, weren't they? They were better? Unfortunately. They were better. Fantastic. I'm afraid to yes. say, nicer than the ones we made with you, That's not even your better. chips. Yeah. Did you cop off? Did it work? Did, did they, did did they did stay? Did they stay? No. But, but no. nice company. Had a good no. night. Yeah. Good night. No romance, but Dating? good night. Uh, Dating? No, but... Willing, open to offers. <laughs> open to offers. <laughs> uh, there is a singleton here this evening. He's a Russian critic. I don't know if you like sort of critics. Oh, we, we met him. Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what does that, what does that mean? He lives in London. So, Too far um, away. He's not, he's not a Viking, yeah. Gordon. He's not <laughs> a Viking. Okay, I've got to go now. <laughs> right. Hey, get in that yeah. kitchen. Stay in there, yes? <laughs> and stay away from the daiquiris. <laughs> right. Flippin' heck. Um, it's, been a, it, it, it's been big news in, in my kitchen, and uh, how's your sperm count? My sperm count's OK, as far as I know. <laughs> and I actually had um, I had a bit of trouble down there. Oh, really? Yeah, I had um, an operation. Um, I had a, a little kind of cyst oh, that really? I... Um, that on, your, on your bollock? On my bollock, I had a cyst. <laughs> and um, 
as it happened, it was benign. But I'm quite happy to talk about okay, it. Because, no, I'm really sorry because, because we should talk about yeah, these no, things, shouldn't we? It's really weird because over the last sort of five or six years, it's been brought to my attention yeah. by my GP that I had a very low sperm count. Because of because being in the kitchen, in, in the heat in the kitchen. When you look at the sort of high level of the stove nowadays. Maybe the same thing for me, but by doing game shows, by resting against that lectern. Yeah. Perched on there. <laughs> uh, family sperm tunes. <laughs> family sperm tunes. <laughs> um, it's all clear down there now. <laughs> it's, it's all good, all yeah. Good. It's all absolutely good. I'm so it? glad the sister's gone. What? <laughs> <laughs> the sis? <laughs> The Beer sister, I thought, hello. <laughs> sister, let's keep up the cooking. Cheers, Thank mate. You. Next on the menu, Giles spreads the word about an up-and-coming delicacy. Come on, people. Squirrel, lovely squirrel, fresh squirrel. It's squirrel. Oh, no. No, you wouldn't kill your cat, would you? If it was tasty, I might. And we find out who's staying and who's going home. The person that I'd like to stay in the F-word kitchen Welcome back to the F word, the food show that's good enough to eat. So, rumour has it you've actually found a good possible source of cheap meat. It's, it's better than cheap meat. I found free meat. It's all around us. I've uh, been eating squirrels. Squirrel, for goodness sake, they're not edible. They're delicious. Yes, yes, he looks all lovely and fluffy and sweet, but he's not. He's a monster. In my local park, he strips the bark from the trees. In the countryside, he eats the eggs of songbirds. In my garden, he digs holes to hide his stupid acorns for the winter. And worst of all, he has terrorised our native red squirrel, little squirrel nutkin, into near extinction. I hate grey squirrels. With greys outnumbering reds by 66 to 1, conservationists last week announced plans to eradicate all grey squirrels in the vicinity of 16 newly designated red squirrel reserves. And later this month, the government plans to publish a policy paper on grey squirrels which may well include a new form of squirrel contraception. That's one way of looking at the grey squirrel problem, but I've got a better solution. We could eat them. It may sound a bit disgusting if you've never had squirrel before, but I have, and it's delicious. Or at the very least, it is reasonably edible. And as there's only two and a half million of them in Britain, it wouldn't take that many of us to roast one up for Sunday lunch this weekend to completely eradicate the grey squirrel by the middle of next week and create a lovely environment for our little friend Squirrel Nutkin to make a peaceful return to Britain. I want to prove just how tasty squirrels are when expertly cooked, so I'm off to the Butler's Wharf Chop House in London, one of the few restaurants that has actually featured squirrel on its menu. How do you cook a squirrel? A uh, squirrel's quite small, so we're going to have to make sure we use a whole animal. So I'll, I'll butch one down now for you. I can see you're taking off the legs here. Yeah? Here we have the thigh of the squirrel, which is from all that jumping around in the trees and you know, springing around. It gets, that's probably got the most meat on it. Yeah, we're going to have to braise the legs, because like you said, they've been jumping around in the trees, so yeah. these legs have done a lot of work. So here we've got the, the saddle with the two loins and the fillets ready to be wrapped in bacon and roasted off. Lovely, tasty, tasty, just like eating normal food, marvellous. Got the two hind legs, which we're going to braise off, serve as they are, nice and Just meaty. Just like having a, like a confit duck leg in a, yep, in a, exactly. in a, in a rubbish high street cat. And then we've got the, the front legs, the bellies, the kidneys and the livers, which are all going to be made into a nice little and puff that, pastry that, you part. And that, is the challenging part. That's all the little bits. That's the little front legs, all the little livers and kidneys, the heart and soul of the squirrel, mashed up, high-tasting, quite smelly, in a little pie case. It's the kind of thing I like, not for the faint-hearted. Squirrel meat is very lean. It's low in fat and high in protein, so Craig's wrapping it in bacon to stop it drying out. Right, well, just while I'm waiting for my squirrel, the sommelier's recommended a Cote de Rhone. Nice and fruity, quite spicy, Syrah Grenache blend, very drinkable, and will go nicely, he reckons, uh, with something as gamey as, a, as an English squirrel. Charles, here's your squirrel. Hope you enjoy it. Yabba dabba do. Look at that. Little thighs for jumping from branch to branch. Mmm, tasty. Oh, that was wonderful. That is the taste of squirrel. Really taste of English woodland, oak trees, and very easy to eat. Delicious. Well, I've got some more cooked squirrel, and now all I need to do is convince everybody else to eat it. Fresh squirrel. <laughs> It's like chicken. Yeah, of course. But it tastes a bit like a cross between pork and chicken. It's not a heavy taste, it's very light. I wouldn't have thought a squirrel would have even looked like that once it was cooked, let alone taste like that. Do you think you'll be having it again? <laughs> um, it was all right. It wasn't, wasn't too bad. Bit, bit, you know, nutty, maybe. <laughs> Damn, it's like chicken. It's a little bit gamey, 
quite a little bit greasy, but in a good way. And um, mm, that's not pubic hair, is it? No, 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 that's squirrel hair. Squirrels don't have pubic hair. Hello. It's squirrel. Oh, no. No, you wouldn't kill your cat, would you? But if it was tasty, I might. I don't know. You think it'll catch on? Could do. Probably not. It tastes really good. It tastes kind of similar to... Well, just don't say it tastes similar to chicken. Come on. You've got to... uh, it's kind of quail, I thought, when I ate it. Yeah? Yeah. Well... You, is it, can, you imagine, can you imagine buying squirrel and cooking it yourself at home? Yeah, I can. I think it's good. So there you go. People are really pretty happy to eat squirrel, and so they should be. It's a tasty and nutritious way to get rid of the evil grey and make an environment fit for squirrel nutkin to return in triumph. So the next time you're in your local park and you see one of the little critters running around, don't think, ooh, little furry friend, think lunch. So, will you be eating them again? Yeah, they tasted all right, and, and if I can get rid of them from my garden, then I reckon two birds with one stone, two squirrels with one stone, definitely. So is it legal? It is legal. Uh, if they're causing damage, if you have permission from the landowner, or you are the landowner, mm -hmm. it is permis permissible to, to shoot them and kill them. Um, you have to, they, like all animals in Britain, they're protected from cruelty, like yeah. any wildlife, so you have to do it cleanly. You can't go around maiming squirrels for fun. But yeah, absolutely.